Okay, I shall introduce our first speaker, who is Tom Epperly, a researcher who has joined the Gay Research Lab here recently, all the way from New Zealand. Your slides. Thank you for the kind introduction. as entry points into digital virtual worlds and social interactions in those worlds has influenced how some people approach online behaviour and may be the root of some behaviours which are considered toxic. Today I'm going to explore some of the misguided logics imported from gaming into, into, in the online behaviour of Hollywood <coughs> actor James Franco, who is the star of the film Your Highness. I'm deliberately referencing his crappiest film. I don't know what to say. Hey, allegedly, he's also made some good ones. So, here I've attempted to create a kind of narrative cohesion around the talk by suggesting I'm going to talk to these six points. It's like maybe three points more than you should really talk to during a talk, but um, I'm, I'm trying to move some pieces around so that we can really understand this James Franco guy. So let me just start off by trying to position this project a little bit. This is part of a larger project that I've been working on since 2014 with colleagues in Australia. This project is called Avatars and Identities and it examines the video game avatar from an interdisciplinary cultural studies perspective and draws on literary theory, media archaeology and digital ethnography. The goal of the project is to highlight the techno-cultural techno significance of the avatar for understanding changing notions of individual and collective identity and interpersonal communication in the digital era. Our basic argument is that the avatar is both a crucial concept and technical device in making the experience of digital virtuality mundane and has thus shaped everyday understanding of being, thinking and acting in such spaces. To date, we have 20 plus published research outcomes from the project. I was supposed to have like an impressive bibliography here, but I forgot to put that slide in. Uh, while there are a few more publications in the pipeline, the focus now this year is to write an, um, a book length manuscript. Mm -hmm. The material I'm presenting today is from an in progress draft article targeted at social media and society. The draft draws on work done by research assistants on the project, Australian-based scholars Brendan Keogh and Guy Zhang. This draft presents one of a series of case studies from the Avatars and Identities project, which examine how the avatar as a concept has shifted into other contexts of digital communication, particularly on social media platforms. So there's previous research has looked at how the avatar is used on gambling platforms this one's kind of considering the avatar in relation to selfie culture. Now, the connection between gaming and photography is a relatively unexplored topic. Um, if you follow the Games Network list, I'm sure a few people do, you've all seen that um, while it's not very intellectually explored, it's of a great deal of interest to people for some reason at the moment. Um, now, there's one key article, which is by Cindy Perema in uh, Games and Culture in 2007, called Point and Shoot, Remediating Photography in, in Game Space. Aside from that, there have only been a few um, published works examining the use of photography in games, including works by Giddings and Mooring and Demutis. More recently, work has emerged that focuses on uh, extra-diegetic uh, screenshots. So I'm saying extra diegetic, um, it's like uh, 
think that I study film as an undergraduate and it refers to stuff that's happening outside of the world of the film. So like um, you can take a screenshot of a game and it's a photograph too. It's not a photograph which is taken inside the game. Um, so this kind of screenshot is also a form of photography with games. And uh, more recently, um, Alison Gazard has um, added a welcome perspective on the role of photography itself in shaping how we historicize, remember, and feel about game cultures and our own experience of games in the past. The focus of the selfie and game, games and gaming cultures began with thinking about how selfie itself was included in games, as well as how players might use in-game cameras and screenshot functions to take photographs of their avatars. We also located games which allowed players to upload photographs of themselves, which were digitized into in-game avatars. And there's in fact um, various kind of bespoke businesses which would do this for you if you want to have a really uh, avatar that looks a lot like you in Second Life from one of these gambling platforms. Uh, and there's also devices which um, auto-generate avatars for you with the device's camera. So if anyone's ever used a Nintendo DS with a camera, which I'm assuming probably never happened to any of you, but, but these people did get to do it. And if you remember, like there's like this game where it's an augmented reality game and these uh, kind of faces come firing at you and you've got to tap on them. No, no one remembers that game. I can prove it existed. I, I've got a slide of it. <laughs> Oops. Wait, wait, wait. I was supposed to mention that I was going to show a picture of a dick before I started the talk, and Alina forgot to remind me. I'm sorry. All right, so we'll, we'll look at that more closely later. But th this one here um, is, you know, a very simple kind of game which um, demonstrates the Nintendo 3DS's augmented functions. And with, with the start of it, you take a selfie. And then it turns the selfie into a little monster that you've got to tap on. And then there's also, you can use the selfie to set up your Me in the Nintendo DS as well. The, uh, this is from the DSi onward for sticklers about the various 14 versions of the Nintendo DS. I'm assuming that there's some out there. And uh, these devices and functions allow people to play with their own digital identity by how they curate a more or less abstract digital rendering of themselves and their video game avatars and how these representations are placed within a kind of virtual landscape. So I'll just uh, show you a couple of um, you know, recent interesting things. So there was a, a project which um, uh, recreated Doom using a selfie stick instead of a gun. Uh, anyone ever check out that one? It's pretty nice. And then there's this really famous um, uh, indie game by Robert Yang called Cobra Club, which um, the game involves kind of, you're locked in a bathroom and you're taking dick pics and you're sending it to people in this kind of like uh, network. <coughs> and meanwhile, your mum's knocking on the door asking if you're okay. <laughs> um, it's, it's a really nice game. Um, you know, in, in terms of, it's up there with Snatch probably. Um, and and part, part of uh, your role in the game is to like um, modulate your dick pic in real time. So you're like, oh, more, less pubes, longer, shorter, wider, danglier balls, etc. On you go. It's quite fun. And all the dick pics you take when you, you use playing the game get saved in weird places on your computer. So you're like, after, even after you've deleted the game, you're finding them like afterwards. <laughs> Months and years. It's part of the fun. Uh, well, that's printing screens, yeah. Uh, this is like examples of um, Game Boy Advance photography. So it's kind of um, had a bit of a comeback. Game Boy Advance um, released a camera in 1998. At the time, it was the um, lightest and most, um, most best digital camera which was on the market. I mean, that's 21 years ago now, so it's pretty... Uh, Pretty weird to think about that time, but it was on this handheld device, and this was the kind of quality of images it was able to take. And um, you know, the peripheries for that device included a printer, so you could print them out, etc. One of the really interesting things about the Game Boy camera was that you couldn't delete any of the images. 
So when you actually, if you as an archivist or um, in the future go and try to find one, you're going to find some really interesting old images from people which are guaranteed to include at least one of them, but <laughs> in my experience. And then uh, what I was talking before about um, using screenshots to kind of create this um, sense of um, a selfie. This is from um, a part of uh, a, a games wiki for a game, school, game called Dark Souls. Um, maybe Dark Souls 2 as well, possibly even Dark Souls 3. But the whole point of this part of the wiki is to actually share a picture of your character where, they, where you're really proud of how awesome they look because of the clothes that they've got on and their weapon and crown, etc. in front of some kind of Easter that you think is really cool as well. So this is, a, this is kind of like a game which uh, I guess isn't really characterized by um, uh, an interest in a particular kind of aesthetic or anything like that necessarily. That people like maybe power gaming and putting on the best armor in terms of damage wise. But after each one of these pictures there's like this big discussion of like what items they are and where they found them and etc. So that other people can go and try to recreate the outfits. So. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting uh, side effect. So I realise now that I'm going on to the next section, which requires me to turn a couple of pages. Okay. Now, theorisations of the selfie, particularly those exemplified in the work of Katrin Tiedenberg, have been generative for my own understanding of the selfie in games and gaming. Cultures. Three points that have a great deal of resonance are, first, the ways that selfies make different kinds of bodies visible in the public sphere. Second, how dominant traditional cultures respond by attempting to silence and discipline the visibility of these bodies. And third, how selfies are a genre of communication associated with personal veracity and intimate forms of mass communication. So they're real or authentic in some kind of way. Right, like this, like Kim Kardashian without makeup. Right, everyone's like, "Well, Kim, no makeup. That's real. You keep it real, Kim." I'm trying. I'm not deliberately trying to sound sarcastic. Just like, you know, in New Zealand, we're kind of like Finns and we have flat voices. As a, as a cultural <coughs> form, which utilizes the everyday ubiquity of network cameras, uh, phones and popular photo sharing platforms, selfies have enabled different kinds of bodies to appear in popular media, which are not generally unfiltered by editorial processes, which may potentially unwittingly exacerbate or enforce standards based on ableist, heteronormative, patriarchal, and or colonial notions of body normativity. These conspicu the conspicuous appearance of people of color, people with disabilities, women and genderqueer, Women and genderqueer and non-binary people in digital cultures and platforms through selfies runs parallel to the new diversity in the gaming public, which is described by Salter and Blodgett. The inclusion of difference in the new gaming public is precarious and fraught, and explicitly underwritten by silencing minorities who seek to change or challenge non-inclusive norms, actions and behaviours within the community. In a similar manner, selfies themselves are often derided, not merely as banal, but as vain, narcissistic, and also potentially unsafe. This derision is often implicitly, and even often explicitly, gendered, which is especially problematic in contemporary youth pedagogy, which often perpetuates a culture of victim blaming through uh, blaming young women for, for sharing selfies, um, or um, in particular, uh, practices around uh, sexting and the sharing of nudes, where um, when these when these images circulate, um, uh, the women who have had them taken of them are considered to be at fault rather than the person that they trusted who has circulated the item illegally. This figure, oh, sorry, um, selfies are often viewed as a kind of lowest common denominator of popular culture that represents a exact ground zero of cultural decline that's precipitated by the internet. So this figure is 
exemplified in a gendered way by this fake gamma girlfriend, which is kind of a meme, although I couldn't really find any of the meme, but this is basically how, how it works. Um, which illustrates the kind of privilege which is taken for granted by early adopters, male, white, etc., early adopters of, of PC and console gaming, where with young women whose entry point into gaming and gaming culture is their mobile phone and have less knowledge about the history of gaming are kind of mocked for what they're interested in. Selfies researchers, however, argue that the selfie is a subtle genre of intimate and ambient auto autobiographical communication. They often cite its integration into popular political movements and the growing importance of the selfie and the cultivation of celebrity and micro-celebrity as examples of how the selfie is able to resonate with people and create networks of ambient and effective communication through shared experience. I want to consider how scholarship on selfies may enrich the concept of the avatar, particularly in light of gamer logic. Now, this is kind of um, me really quickly, 15 minutes ago, trying to think of something which might exemplify gaming logic. And I realized that probably no one knows what Seinfeld is. Or maybe it's on Netflix now and everyone does. But it's also that be made extra banal because of that and no one cares about it anymore. But um, this is like a really famous episode where George uh, tries to reclaim um, a Frogger um, con uh, arcade cabinet that he's got a high score on that dates back from the 80s. And it ends in disaster. But they kind of, they kind of re replay this moment which is exactly like Frogger, um, yeah, humorously. It's not really a game of logic because game of logic is more like a context collapse where um, paradigms developed in techno-social context of video games and play, particularly approaches to winning and mastery that are deliberately or, are deliberately or unconsciously shifted into other domains. This context collapse is facilitated by widespread gamification, quantification, datification and surveillance, which have produced game-like elements in just about every contemporary situation particularly activities which take place on social media platforms. The game logic that I'm elaborating today is one that I'm calling strategic vulnerability, which is a strategic and deliberate staging of a permeation of the social media avatar that exposes an equally constructed, private, authentic, and quotes, self. In global media, biopolitics, and AFX, hmm, Knudsen and stage argue that sharing bodily vulnerability can create an effective resonance between bodies that is intensified by social media and offers individuals the opportunity to bypass institutional hierarchies in the creation of new collectives. Ooh. Strategic vulnerability as a gamer logic builds on the beliefs found among significant undercurrent within gaming cultures that the real gamers are and have always been marginalized underdogs. A privilege, a position identified by scholars as one of white masculine privilege and fragility. In forthcoming work on gamer logic, that is also part of the larger Avatars and Identity Project with Marlianne Rakomkal Butt, I outline how this undercurrent operates using a logic of insincerity. By tuning on the idea of by tuning to the idea of play to deny accountability for their actions. <clears throat> So I wasn't really harassing that person, I was just playing. Don't they, why don't they understand I'm just playing with them? It's just a joke. Um, both as a tactic of self-justification and also victim shaming. So also you're extra dumb because you didn't understand that I was just messing with you. I suggest that strategic vulnerability imports the logic of the avatar feature that is found in many forms of digital gaming. The avatar in gaming establishes an affective and emotional connection between the game software and the player or players by creating a vulnerability through which the player's body not just executes control, but is also <coughs> open to the effective intensities which are produced through attuning the rhythms of bodies and software. Ooh. Got my slides messed up here. 
A effect is a pre-personal intensity that corresponds to the passage from one exceptional experiential state of the body to another and implying an augmentation or diminution in the body's capacity to act. That's a quote from Brian Masumi, who's like uh, one of many leading scholars in affect theory. Um, and I'm using like a, a pretty simple um, approach to affect. There's like very, very manifest many approaches and some of them are significantly elaborate. So one that I'm using is to um, split, like mm -hmm. to consider emotion as a quality, which is socially and culturally defined, while the intensity or, of affect is a quantitative bodily sensation that emotion expresses, but does not encapsulate entirely. My starting point, point for bringing affect into my approach to digital games is an interest in how they evoke a pleasure of the body so that there's like something about games which is pleasurable experience for the body also not just pleasurable in the positive sense there's kind of like um, challenges difficulties hardships of the body that have to be overcome has anyone ever had like a, a, a gaming related injury no sisu yeah oh you had one Nice. Yeah. Does, does mental health count? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good point. Yeah. Not if you're a white guy. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, good, good call. Um, my so, um, so the avatar has an important role in structuring the flow of these intensities um, to and from the player. Games often suggest that players should cultivate a sense of care in the avatar, both on an aesthetic and narrative level through cuteness and other characteristics, but also because the avatar is a point of vulnerability to the vicissitudes of the game world, which is the focus of the player's attention and action. The successful maintenance of the avatar in the game world in the face of ongoing threat creates an investment of affect in the avatar because sustaining the avatar is performed through the organization and orchestration of the player's body and senses to the rhythms of the game. This requires the constant recalibration of haptic and kinesthetic inputs that include specific focused micro movements and micro attentions, as well as mobilizing the body to an extent that it may lead to a total stage, uh, a total change in comportment. I don't know if anyone recognizes this kind of phenomenon. <clears throat> and this one. The explicit role of affect in game design, which I describe as game studies effective term, because I like to just name a turn every couple of years, <laughs> um, has been, you know, I get it right like 25% of the time, um, which just has been explicitly highlighted in re recent scholarship by Enable, Ash, and Shaw. And um, Enable has also got a book out now this year that I haven't had a chance to read yet, so I haven't put it up there. Ash describes the process of effective design, which is directed at holding users' attention by careful modulation of effect through aesthetic and material design. Enable characterizes casual games as effective systems, arguing that we make choices and push buttons in games because of how games structure our feelings about those choices and actions. Ash, who focuses on AAA games, argues that every aspect of video games is effectively designed on a micro level to generate particular forms of affect. Shell's work on machine gambling argues that the gambling industry is driven by a design process which is based on adaptive attunement to consumers' desires, affects, and bodies. The goal is to create a product that is designed to facilitate affective balance and con to continuity of play. So even though these scholars are talking about really different kinds of games, they're all framing the process of game design around this kind of 
very reflexive modulation of effect. Gaming cultures create defined frameworks for bodies and intensities of digital gameplay to be socially expressed. Avatars become a basic form of autobiographical expression as experience reward systems open up new opportunities to customise the player's avatar and showcase their achievements through a pool of collectors, store, scores, purchases, player histories, scores and social interactions. The key to making the, this quality of gaming autobiographical is by connecting it with an enduring account or profile on a social media platform. So we're seeing in the last decade or so all of these game style environments around gaming where achievements and so on are stored and, and shared. While the avatar is a technical element of digital games, where it refers to a controllable object that re represents the user in the digital virtual space, this term is used both formally and informally to describe various elements of the user profile on social media sites, particularly user-selected images which reoccur and become so associated with the uh, individual's presence online. Notable scholars that conceptualize avatars in social media include Beth Coleman and Daniel Miller. For Miller, the avatar is not a technology, but a technique that allows for the separation of the public and private within social media platforms to be used to create a public persona while also maintaining more intimate networks. The vulnerability of the avatar to the environmental challenges of the game means that there's an element of care in players' relationship with the avatar. I mean, this is illustrated in many works and probably people who have played games might have a story about caring for an avatar somehow. Um, in some games, this intensity is heightened further by the ability to customize the avatar at the start of the game and invest in game rewards or even money into developing the appearance, equipment and abilities of the avatar as the game progresses. And in fact, in some games, like Fortnite, this is all you can really do because you don't get a dedicated avatar as far as I know. The point I want to bring forward to the discussion of Franco is the idea that the avatar is for games already a point of intense vulnerability. Sorry, for gamers already a point of intense vulnerability. But that this vulnerability is mitigated by an attunement to potential dangers and cultivation of habits and processes which reduce vulnerability both within and outside the game. In the work I've already mentioned with Marley Ann, we had considered how the conception of the avatar had contributed to the justification of various forms of online harassment by people who support a game again. The insincerity of it is just a game, was extended to it's not real, as it was merely avatars sparring with each other within the technical rules of the platform. As I began to research selfies, one of the first things I discovered that connected selfies with avatars was this extremely misplaced slide. Um, was James Franco's December 2013 New York Times op-ed, The Meaning of the Selfie. The key, a key quote is, we all have different reasons for posting them, but in the end, selfies are avatars. Many me's that we send out to give others a sense of who we are. And uh, these are the um, images that were in that story um, on the New York Times, and those are from his um, Instagram account. A sentiment, this sentiment has strong resonance with how researchers have argued selfies are used to create and sustain a feeling of intimacy and closeness among online communities. Our prominent celebrities and micro-celebrities have been particularly effective in harnessing the selfie to build an intimate relationship with their audience. However, in early 2018, in the wake of the Me Too movement's exposure of sex behaviour in the top levels of various industries, and subsequent revelations that Franco's own toxic and predatory behaviour of his behaviour, I revisited and reconceptualised his notion of the selfie. So I have to jump forward a little bit now. Everyone still feel okay? It's getting hot in here, right? Uh, 
Now, Franco does not, as far as I can tell, identify a gamer as a gamer in any substantial way. And in a, if anything, he seems to be much more invested in his identity as a sort of like general auteur, artist, etc. Um, but the, his New York Times pieces, particularly serendipitous encapsulation of a game of logic um, and a gamified approach to selfies. And by, by looking into his behavior, I think some of the more uh, tricky things emerge. So particularly since Me Too, numerous controversies have emerged about Franco's problematic behavior towards women and girls. Now I'm using the term girl in a legal sense because this is referring to people who are not yet legally adults, right? So just scientific reasons. This behavior is basically too extensive to cover here, but includes a substantial number of professional contexts. I do want to consider this behavior alongside his understanding of the role of the selfie in his public and private life. And also that can be found in his writing to explore this logic of the strategic vulnerability. Now, Franco takes a very experimental stance on his use of the selfie in his now closed Instagram account. In a recent interview with Variety, which took place in 2017, he states, I was like testing the bounds. It's sort of the way I see people like the Kardashians. They're staking out new ground and what these spaces are. They're making a lot of money out of it. What will happen if I do that? And you get reactions. So, um, and this, this image in particular is um, what he was talking about. Um, and although his account's been deleted, uh, this, this image is still widely available on the, on the internet. This selfie of Franco suggests, and his, and his description of it, suggests a personal experiment with the idea of celebrity, an ironic act of an artist that is conscious of their own performance. Yet this selfie deliberately also references the practices of celebrities who are women of colour in creating intimacy and shared effect through the vulnerability of nude, pregnant and cosmetic free selfies. So I perceive the strategic, stage strategic vulnerability across Franco's self, expression of self. Even in his use of queer to describe his artistic practice which he does while constantly reasserting his straight sexuality. The key issue is that there is apparently nothing substantive at stake in his attempts to convey vulnerability beyond the appearance of being vulnerable. <coughs> the vulnerability is an empty gesture, whereas vulnerability is staged through taking on a pseudo-identity. Yet Franco's vulnerability is only through the associations he can mobilize through this gesture. He can don and remove identities as it suits him because he is a white, straight, gender normative, able male who, while other people are asserting their differences and placing themselves at risk of potential harm, Franco is merely playing with identity. Social media thus takes on an avatar-like quality for Franco where various identities are available to customize his experiences without him recognizing the privilege that is in place for him to have this position as an identity tourist. Yet Franco's strategic vulnerability becomes even more concerning because of his confessed use of selfies in, in his sexual predation. In his 2013 book, Actors Anonymous, Franco explicitly states that the role that the selfies play in his recruitment of potential sexual partners. One of my favorite approaches was to ask the young girls that requested to take a photo with me to email me a copy of the photo. That way I can give them my info very quickly in front of the crowd of fans and later work out a way to see them. 
So this experimental edgy practice of identity tourism through the appropriation of queer that Franco uses to create a sense of vulnerability and intimacy also extends to a forced intimacy with his audience as the selfies become a technique of gathering data about his audience for predatory purposes. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly conclude because I don't know what the time is. Yeah, time to <laughs> conclude. As video game platforms continue to implement and improve effective design, gaming will become increasingly intertwined with issues game scholars may consider more significant for social media or platforms than they are for games. This increases the potential for context claps between games and other forms of online interactions, particularly in relation to behaviours which are considered negative or aberrant, such as harassment. James Franco, Franco is not an isolated case. He's merely able to exploit his celebrity and top off other forms of privilege to explore mutable avatar-esque identity where real differences are used to, as a way of suggesting otherness while ultimately being able to deny that identity while people who actually have that identity are still left exposed to harassment. Told there won't be any questions. <laughs> yeah, this guy uh, so you got a question, I can, I can answer the question potentially. Uh, great, yeah, informally. Uh, so I, uh, I'm not fully seeing the connection between the use of strategic vulnerability by James Franco and the way I perceive avatars and the way people cultivate them. So it seems to me avatars are cultivated in a way to be impressive and dominating over the environment, whether it is beautifully dominating or it is uh, mechanically dominating. Uh, and the strategic vulnerability by James Franco seemed oriented specifically on not being dominated in order to get people to be drawn towards you. Well, um, I mean, I think that's uh, how I describe it, is that he's attempting to dominate um, a particular sub-market of um, teenage fans, right, in, 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 a, in this particular way. But yeah, like there's, um, the selfie is a strategy of intimacy and the avatar as a kind of stand-in for the selfie. There are some peculiarities which need to be worked out still. Uh, so thanks for that. So one thing I was thinking about was that the James Franco explicitly attacked from a public perspective his sexuality, right? Saying straight and gay, right? Which opens you up to attack um, in a homophobic society. And I'm thinking about in a gamer environment, if someone doesn't was to make their avatar, you know, maybe gay guy, one, two, three, uh, the attacks that would come, I don't see that as strengthening them from, yeah in gamer culture. Okay, so I'm now thinking that maybe we're talking at cost purposes a little bit. Yeah. I, I don't really understand what you're saying. Uh, well, what I understood was the uh, use of avatars cultivates a strategic vulnerability as a strategy of uh, success yep. in gamer culture. And you're saying that that might not work in gamer culture, right? That this kind of this kind of like sensitive nice guy, maybe gay, kind of playing with identity kind of thing, but it works differently in social media. Right. Well, I'm not seeing uh, the connection of playing the thing that is attackable as successful in gamer culture. Okay. Still don't quite get your question. Uh, am, am I missing something about the connection of James Franco's open, this is who I am, you can attack me, maybe I'm gay, maybe I'm not, strategy style? And is there a place in gamer culture where gamers open themselves up to attack as a strategy of success? No, they're, they're, they're importing the logic into a new context. 
in order to attack a new target in a different way. That this is what I'm suggesting. Right, that so, like, I can play with my identity and I can use it to gain things that I want to gain. Is that, is that helping? Okay, so it's, it's the, the idea of an intentional identity presentation. Yeah, one that is advantageous to you in that situation. Uh, thanks for those questions, though, because, uh, yeah. Um, Sabina, you had a question. Yeah, well, uh, the way I understand it is that it only works one way. So the in-game sort of conventions of avatarness get exported to a culture where people use that staging in order to get something, like in order to reinforce their own powerful stance. Do you, do you understand that correctly? Like, it doesn't go the other way, where um, the vulnerability presentation of a person imported into gaming culture wouldn't work because of the overt harassment space that is gaming. Is, is that somehow, I don't know. That yeah, that's, that, that's a pretty uh, articulate way of, yeah. I mean, I wasn't even considering it the other way around. Sorry for any confusion. Okay. I guess the I guess point there is that in uh, gamer gamer culture, the avatars you try to make the avatars powerful and cool, and that gets you points, like social points in gamer culture. Where in selfie culture, you try to make them vulnerable and and um, questioning, and that gains you social points in the selfie culture. And so basically, both both type types of avatar creation, the selfies and the gamer. Uh, in gamer culture, actual avatars, both of those avatar creations are aiming to um, like present themselves as most powerful in that sub-context. Maybe. I have a question also, but Please. I want to continue on this topic. Uh, so my question is actually uh, that uh, are there like earlier examples of this similar kind of Kind of situation because people have considered social interactions a game a lot longer than there is a like digital gaming culture, for example, all the way down to Shakespeare or anything like this quotes of uh, all the world's stage and so on. But I mean that's an ancient concept, of course. So um, are there like specific elements that uh, associated with are associated with digital gaming culture and the uh, selfie culture of? Of like um, current social social media, because I I imagine there are definite connections that haven't been in earlier contexts. But I I would be really interested in knowing more about that. Okay, um, I'm not sure I understand your question. Yeah. Um, can you maybe just rephrase it like yeah. as one sentence? Sure. So, what are the connections between? Digital gaming cultures, avatars, and the selfie avatars in social media culture that aren't existent in the previous iterations okay. of. Okay, so I mean, basically, in my argument, it would be something like what what is present is a kind of um, in-game camera, which allows yeah. you to kind of mix uh, avatars with personal. Uh, pictures of yourself or to replace pictures of yourself with your avatar or put an avatar as your um, uh, headshot on Facebook or on LinkedIn even, th th this kind of stuff. Don't do so it on LinkedIn. Basically meshing of the two different mediums. Yeah. yeah. About, yeah. And so my, my, one of my arguments is that social media and games uh, can't really be considered that discreet anymore. That, 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 that they're integrated already in quite powerful ways and that this is in fact an element of a effective design that people have a desire to um, try to express what they've what they've felt and share it with others yeah okay yeah. thanks Hey, you had a question, Mika. Well, more about rebuttal that I don't necessarily agree that all gamers seek to present the most powerful avatars possible. I'd say it depends on the peer group you're involved with. For instance, when I play multiplayer games, 
I usually play with people from a well-known internet comedy forum where, they, well, I mean, I guess it kind of, you could say that we're trying to be the most powerful by being, like, putting on silly costumes and where the object isn't to be like a macho king, but more commonly some kind of ridiculous little elf or something in the dumbest costume you can possibly find. So, so the, 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 it's renegotiated within the community or something yeah, like that. but it's the same performative aspect, of course. Just mm. with the idea of trying to make other people laugh instead of trying to look like you're a fourteen year old. <laughs> okay. And I uh, yep, thanks man. Um so uh considering the, the history of like um musicals in the nineteen early nineteen hundreds <coughs> and the use of ambiguous uh and weakness in the male main character to get attractive to the female audience. Um do you think there's a potential that some of this social media transition comes from that tradition? Well, well uh, this sounds like a really interesting question to raise, but I'm pretty unfamiliar with um, that area of film history. But yeah, like, be, why, why not? What isn't a part of this found in something else? A, a kind of playing with ideas of gender. I mean, the the uh, Acting traditionally was an area where that was done, but it was done for patriarchal reasons because, um, in my understanding, in um, Anglo sphere acting, women weren't allowed to act or something along those lines. It had to be men and boys. I mean, I'm dealing with pretty unfamiliar territory here for me. Uh, yeah, I was going to suggest along the same lines a little bit that um, what comes to my mind is the um, the carnival, the traditional carnival, even going back to ancient Rome where kind of um, roles were reversed for resistance and, um, and even in Saturnalia and all these kind of festivities that this was the time to criticize the establishment or the the, the um, the kind of the norm of things and then there was a kind of a limited space or frame of time that you could just kind of that comes to the musical tradition later on okay. and all that so it comes back that the kind cool. of the the cultural history of carnival especially from the perspective of identity and power structures might be worth taking a look at no and no well, now i kind of understand this question yeah. better so thanks for bringing that yeah, up i was i was kind of yeah. trying to so you know, get it out of my mouth in so, the right way, but thanks for the music reference. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. if we're talking about something like the carnivalesque, like so the carnivalesque kind of disrupts norms mm -hmm. and I think that like Franco's behaviour, for example, plays into that notion without disrupting any norms. So it's a kind of like a, a postmodern carnivalesque with only <laughs> superficial. Yeah, and then there was also the kind of um, limits of regulation that came with it. Well, still talking about ancient Rome, where with the kind of the framework of the carnival, so that you could do things within that frame that would not be possible otherwise, so that slaves could mock their masters and so on and so forth. And then once the the time frame is over, that well, this is the end of the party. You would not be able to do it afterwards without punishment. So that whether these kind of the digital or virtual space creates a certain um, kind of operative environment that allows things that you would not be able to do or say elsewhere. And now this boundary is getting blurred um, in ways that becomes problematic is what is acceptable conduct and where and what, what constitutes harassment and to whom. But a quick side note. I would be kind of looking at it from a ga um, gambling studies perspective. I would be fairly cautious with um, Natasha Shaw's a book because it's the argument is valid, but it's not fully hers as strongly as she presents it. And the book was pretty much slaughtered in the gambling studies and especially the kind of um, non-problem studies industry side for for um, plain errors. Tsk, tsk. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you sorted that out for me. I didn't know anything yeah. about them. Um, yeah, because I mean, it's it, it certainly makes a good case, but it has yeah. um, it's a several weird, ethical problems. It's a weird book. It's one of the weirdest books I've bothered to read the whole yeah. thing off. Um, Yako, you had a question. No, I, I think I had a comment. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really interested in sort of you picking James Franco because I, I think he's a, he's an interesting character and has been for a long while. And one thing that I, I find interesting about him is, is that he's not only an actor but he's, he's a trained artist. He's, he's been to art school, and I think that is visible in many of the things that he does. I mean, he's, yeah. he's aware of many of these discourses. He, he's, he may not use the words, but performativity is very much present there. Yeah, and, and, um, and, and I think, yeah. and, and, and especially sort of the way he's been uh, piggybacking on, on, on gay and queer stuff is interesting because sort of he's, he first he positioned, he positioned himself in the is he or isn't he box, but very fast it was clear that he he's completely straight but he has done so many things uh portrayed so many gay characters and his his sort of art films are about creating gay porn which is where is he physically based like in real space uh, I, I, I think i think he's he's based uh, in 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 in, uh, in california but he's so so california. But, but he studied <laughs> he studied art in new york if i remember okay. correctly yeah so in my country, we have a word for people like him, which is art school wanker. <laughs> um, I don't know how you refer to people like that in Finland, but it's like palpable. Like I've just graduated from college, and I'm you know going to use all of these theories and so on on you. Um, so thanks for that, Jaco. Um, you, you, had a, you had a question there, John? Yeah, again, more more of a comment building on the <laughs> building on the the Saturnalia and the and the stage stuff. I mean, these these are very you know kind of um, classic liminal zones, you know, in which the kind of the borders between um, uh, you know what is kind of normal and allowed, and then this this fantasy space almost. And obviously, games have been a been a liminal zone for a, for a long time, but maybe this is. I'm not sure if there's some kind of uh, the the reach of games now, and the reach of social media means that maybe they're not liminal in the sense that they have originally been, but that's what's causing this interesting kind of uh, interaction because it's the liminal becoming almost mainstream. So, I mean, I only, I only understand liminal from this Victor Turner guy. Is okay. that is that? Um, not that I'm not aware of that one. I mean, I I understand the liminal zones more from the social anthropological perspective, in which you know there are, as I said, with Saturnalia and, and stuff like that, and also with, with the gambling, it's a kind of a, a space in which is equalising where things which are not normally allowed are possible. Yeah, but there's also a reassertion of the correct power dynamics at the end of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, after the limit, yeah. has, has it been exceeded? Or? And so it's a way of discussing various rituals and so on mm -hmm. and um, uh, the cultures that Turner was studying, is it? Um, to, I yeah, know, I, I, I made the question. I can't remember. Oh, there's, okay. um, there's some literature on, on games and liminality, so... Right. Yeah. We'll, we'll pull that up. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. But, but, but I, I, would, I would look at irony. I think in Franco, all of his pictures are, are a secret irony. He's, he's never earnest in anything. Yeah, so I mean, no, that, that's like, again, like classic internet culture and mm -hmm. so on. Yeah. There's like at least three books on irony and in internet yeah. culture. But I mean, you know, and this is the kind of critique of internet culture as this kind of normative gamma gazy begizzing kind of thing mm -hmm. is the irony which it takes on is, is a kind of. Um, white male privileged position. Yeah. Just one, because it's so, so late, just briefly, I was wondering if you could summarize your main points about authenticity and toxicity, so this relationship um, between those, now we have talked about the cannibalesque and, the, um, and this sort of strategy of vulnerability, but I wonder how this really ties into toxicity for you. Okay, well, that's a good question because I didn't end up really speaking very much about it. So um, I'll go first to um, authenticity. So for me, authenticity is something which is always in, you know, and you can hit me with baseball bat if I do that. But you know, like I, I, it's a word that I'm always saying um, 
offset in finger quotes. Um, I don't really know what that particularly means, but it's a kind of thing which gets evoked um, by people that something's authentic or not. And when people feel that something's authentic, maybe it means that they like it, or I don't, maybe it means that they don't. But it sort of feels real to them. Now, in terms of toxicity, well, what I'm interested in really around this stuff is how in the transferal from gamer culture to um, other forms of online behavior, toxicity gets embedded and kind of becomes established. Well, if that's the, that's a kind of where where does this toxicity come from? Is it because the context is new and doesn't work in the same way, or is it being transferred from? You know, or is it part and part? coming from games and or and the wrongness of the new context. All right, I think our time is up. Thank you for the for the discussion and the comments and questions and thank you Tom for presenting us your talk.